It is extremely difficult. I think it's even more difficult when you're a teenager because all these people are saying you're just a teenager, you can't be an alcoholic, um, have a drink, you know, but they don't realize that if I have that one drink, I'm gonna want another, and then I'm gonna want another, and then it's gonna be to the point where I'm just not gonna care, just give me the whole bloody bottle and I'll guzzle it all down, right? On the way home, my mom and I passed an accident on, on the highway and it was a really bad accident. I said, oh my God, mom, you know, holy, I wonder what happened to them and I hope that never happens to us. I, I don't know how to describe the feeling. It was, I was crying. I, I felt like my whole world was caving in around me. It was, it was the worst I've ever felt in my life. Well, when you're not drinking, you got your mind on other things. Like I got my mind on my car and my bike all the time, or, or and or my drawing. It's, it's, it's a lot more freedom from drinking because drinking is just like being in jail. We've all got real problems, but can't always solve them. We need someone to listen, cause we all need some talking. Some try to ignore, but we've got to explore. We cannot hide it all away, let's do this together. Love, well, I'll talk to you, and you'll talk to me. We've got to reach out to set us so free. To grasp me, talks. A lot of teens drink. In fact, 74% of Canadian teenagers use alcohol. I'm Neil Hope. In the Degrassi series, I played the character Wheels. Both Wheels and I have had our lives changed by alcohol. Wheels lost his parents due to a drunk driving accident. I lost my real father to an alcoholic's disease. You'd think my decision to stay away from alcohol would be an easy one. It's not. Pressures to drink are everywhere. We've traveled around the country to find out how Canadian teenagers are dealing with the issue to drink or not to drink. Ready? Rolling. Okay, hi, this is Celix Hayes Tanassi from Degrassi Talks. Do you drink? No, I'm only 11. Yes, occasionally, I do. Why do you drink? Because uh, I enjoy it, I guess. Because it's socially acceptable. I don't drink. Why do... Drinking's not good. It's bad for your health. Do you guys drink? Yeah. No, 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 stop, stop. <laughs> yeah, I love you too. <laughs> Thanks. Bye-bye. Oh, keep going. My mom says hi. Hi, hi Mom! <laughs> uh, Stephanie, that's kind of a lot. Don't worry, Lucy, it's just like a milkshake. Right? Oh, yeah, milkshake, yeah. huh? <laughs> Chocolate, come on. Uh -oh. Cry, she won't do it. Some people drink to you again with the group, parties. If you drink, uh, you're, you're going to be with us, cool. Drinking's not cool. Drinking's stupid. Well, when all my other friends are drinking and they invite me, I, I go along with it. Once you have a couple and you feel more confident, Teresa lives on a farm with her father and stepmom. Teresa is an alcoholic. I started drinking because I didn't like myself. I felt uh, that nobody liked me, that I felt very unloved. Uh, I felt responsible for everybody else's problems. And alcohol gave me uh, a false sense of, of confidence that I could take on the whole world, that everything was fine, my family was great, nothing was wrong, uh, I could be friendly, and alcohol just, it made me, I thought it made me feel good. I thought that nothing else could make me feel that way but alcohol. How old were you when you started drinking? I was, when I started to drink, I was 12 years old. Why do you guys think teenagers drink? to get away from their depression, from their problems. I drink because um, it, it relaxes me more. And uh, I'm able to be myself more. Well, There's nothing better to do, actually, in yeah. White Horse, so. It's been really well known among a lot of people in, in the Yukon and outside of the Yukon all over Canada that 
White Horse Yukon or the Yukon and the territories in general have a really high drinking rate mm -hmm. um, per capita. There's just a lot of bars. We, we don't ever close our bars on a Sunday. You know, they're always open. You're, there's always a lot of access. You can you get a drink whenever you want. Mm. Um, I started drinking when I was really young. I think I had my first drink when I was about 10 years old. And it just seemed like it was waiting there for me at that age. Like it was sitting there at that part of my path, I guess you could say, and it was waiting for me to pick it up, and I did. Um, I had nothing but terrible experiences with it. It was all like a big, you know, try to fit in. I'm not different anymore. I'm a part of something. Like, I'm not floating anywhere anymore. And um, I really, really abused alcohol. And, and I really got the biggest thing for me is that people automatically um, start judging you and giving you labels. And I got this label of being a orangutan and a, a drunk and a troublemaker and everything else. And it was somebody. You know, I had a label. I was somebody. I wasn't just nobody anymore. Is there any pressure to drink, do you think, for teenagers? The pressure to drink is usually at parties where all your other friends are drinking. And it's really hard to stay away from it because um, they, you're kind of so outcast by your friends when you're not drinking with them. Up here, a majority of the people do drink. Like, you go downtown and you see people, like, you see little girls, like 12 and 13 year olds, going around and they're drunk. When you come from an alcohol, like, uh, three generations of alcoholism, for me, that would mean that there would be an 80% chance that I will become an alcoholic. Do, uh, do parents set a good example for their children? Um, I think in most cases they do. I mean, I, I've heard of many cases when kids say, well, you do it, so it's okay. But that's not really, that's not really so. I think what parents do is, is really their business, because they're adults. My mother drank quite a bit. She had a problem with it. And um, when my dad left, I felt that I had to um, be more responsible. Mm -hmm. I had to be perfect. I, w I became quite a perfectionist, too. Mom, I made it. I made the team. Mom. Oh. Oh. Mom. On the show, I played a character who had an alcoholic mother. and. It really put a lot of pressure on her, and she's always trying to be perfect. And I don't want to go well, to there bed. must have been a lot of pressure on you. Yeah, there was. When I got into grade nine, I started drinking before school. Um, once I was in grade ten, I felt that I had to have that drink before I could, if I was to do it, do well in school, I had to have that drink. Everything revolved around this this alcohol. <laughs> I went to visit Nathan on the Rammer Reserve, and I found out that he and I have a lot in common. That's great. My mom was an alcoholic, and, and uh, you know, I lost my dad about, that was about four years ago. He had cirrhosis of the liver, alcoholic's disease. My mom and dad have separated. My mom lives over in that house over there. My father lives here over that. Alcohol is split them up really do think there is a double standard with the parents because I mean they sit there and they preach to you about oh not going out and getting yourself so drunk you don't even can't even stand up and then like I mean you turn around and there they are you know and doing it and it's like you get preached at so I mean I think a lot of teenagers should learn to preach at their parents about that too well I, I didn't think it was fair because my mom drank a lot too and she was always getting mad at me for drinking and I was like you know take a look at yourself I blame my drinking on my parents I I try to get out of the house and everything, eh? Like, get away from the drink and I end up going into town and getting drunk myself with my friends. How many days a week did you drink and, like, how much a day were you drinking? Four days, roughly. Four days? Four days, yeah. And getting drunk every day? Yeah. Wake up, have a beer. Wait through the day until I pass out. What, what are the side effects of drinking? In the morning, you feel like hell and, uh... But you just do really dumb things that you sometimes regret later. It'll make you drunk and it can ruin your brain. But I don't mind what happens to you when you drink. I kind of like it. What's wrong, Steph? Other than the obvious of getting sick and uh, vomiting, um, 
slurred speech. Uh, you could pass out. Um, people fall down. They get drunk. They fall down. Um, their eyes turn red. <laughs> their breath smells. <laughs> when I went into rehab, um, my finger dexterity was not very good. Um, you had to have a physical examination by a doctor once you first went in. And she told me to take off my shirt. And it took me like a minute and a half to get each button undone. And I just thought that I was clumsy. And she said to me, um, that's the alcohol has numbed your fingertips. That's how much you've been drinking. Okay, my sister was drunk one night. She was walking home. Uh, she fell into, I guess she fell into a van. She fell underneath it. She was dragged underneath it for 72 feet. And she was taken to the hospital. I guess she didn't, she realized what happened, but she didn't really feel the pain. You can hear her screaming in there. I was like, my mom was crying, and I was just sitting there really quiet. Can alcohol kill? Sure. Yes, it can. I think so. How? By getting under the influence of it and doing something that you wouldn't normally do in your right mind. I don't know. <laughs> I guess if you, if you consume too much, probably, yeah. You can never take too much. <laughs> Jimmy Whiffen went out drinking one night with two adults. He downed a bottle of tequila and some beers in half an hour. His blood alcohol level was more than six times the legal limit for drinking and driving. Jimmy Whiffen died of alcohol poisoning. He was only 15. Alcohol can kill because you can spill your drink and then you lose sight of the road, you know? Here, have some. Clutch, man, you know I don't like it. Man, you're worse than my mother. Well, we're going to a party. I don't think we should. Well, if you don't want to go, there's the door. You can walk home. Uh, Clutch, give me the keys, all right? Do you drink and drive? No, I don't drive. But I've been in the car with someone that was drinking and driving, and it was really scary. They were on the wrong side of the road, and they had music on, and they were steering the wheel to the music. It's, it's not worth it. I mean, you, you just drive one night drunk, and they pull your license like that, and you're out of a job, you're... You can't go, you can't pick the bays, you can't go to movies and nothing. <laughs> my, my, my friend Mike, all his friends were drinking and they were driving in to smash into the back of a car. It was really cool. Seven and a half years ago, um, we were on our way, my mom and I, and my little sister Jennifer to get some chicken to bring home for the family. On a Friday night, you know, regular Friday night out, it was about 10 o'clock. And we went and got the chicken, and we were chatting and having, you know, just a talk and stuff. And on the way home, my mom and I passed an accident on, on the highway, and it was a really bad accident. I said, oh, my God, Mom, you know, holy, I wonder what happened to them, and I hope that never happens to us. And 20 minutes later, lo and behold, a drunk driver came up on our side of the road over a hill and hit our car. And as a result, my mom was killed, and um, I was left in a wheelchair. Has it made it more difficult having an identical twin who is a mirror image of yourself? I think during the really low times when you're really hurting and you're really angry, it's worse to have that mirrored image, especially for Missy, who when she feels really down and out about her wheelchair, to look at me walking is really hard for her. One instance, I remember going to the hospital. When the accident first happened, Missy used to kick me out of her room every day, and I couldn't figure out why, you know? And she was so angry with the whole situation that I was her image, that it was hard for me to be there with her while she was trying to heal. So much goes through my mind when I think about the driver of the other car that night. At first, when I first found out I was hurt, when I first found out that why I was in a wheelchair, why I couldn't walk was a drunk driver, I was like, felt really sad for the person because I thought, and when my mom was dead, I felt really sad because I didn't know how I would deal with something like that. How would I deal with the fact that I killed a woman and I put a, a, a young girl in a wheelchair? But there's anger and there's sadness and there's so much built in, so, so much inside of me that... Because there's days when I'm sad and I know I can't get up to go run and get a drink. And I know that it was that drunk driver and I get really mad. But then there's are days when I think, oh, I wouldn't want to be that person. I 
I, I don't know how to describe the feeling. It was, I was crying. I, I felt like my whole world was caving in around me. It was, it was the worst I've ever felt in my life. The 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 party that you were at before the accident. Yes. Um, you know what what was what was the the feeling of the party? You know, with everybody and, and yourself and your friends and everything. What was what was it all like? Well, a lot of the people there hadn't seen each other in months, so you know it was a big drink drink fest. Everybody was trying to drink as much as possible and prove that they could do it. You know, and yeah. there was a couple older guys there, so everybody's you're trying to show them that. I can do this, too, just as well as you can. About 6 o'clock in the morning or 5 o'clock in the morning, I was down at the beach, and a couple of the guys that were with me came up, came down to the beach, and they said, you know, let's go. We're, everybody's getting tired. It's time to leave. Was there any discussion on who should drive? Uh, no, there wasn't. So and we just, you know, didn't think about it at all. You know, drinking and driving wasn't something that happened, would happen to us. And, so we just, we hopped in the car and took off, and we, but we didn't even make it about halfway, I guess. The last thing I remember is coming down the hill and then going into the corner, and that, that's it. I, I don't know if I blocked it out on purpose or, or what, but I, I guess I blacked out for a couple minutes, and I woke up a minute or two after the accident happened. I was still in the, in the driver's seat. I, I hadn't been wearing my seat belt, and the, I guess the steering wheel had held me there. It was broken into a bunch of pieces. But Mark, who was in the passenger seat in the front, he was sort of sitting up on the console, half in, half out of the windshield. It was obvious that he was dead. Um, and I walked around to the back, and the back door of the Jeep it's, comes up. It had ripped halfway off, and one of the guys was sort of hanging out the back of the Jeep. He had blood coming out of his ears and his eyes. Um, and he was also dead. And the other guy who has the head injuries, he was about 10 feet back behind the Jeep, just sitting in the, propped up in the ditch. I wouldn't drink and drive personally, but I have drove, like, lots of times with people who drink and drive. Like, I'm just worried about getting an impaired bed. I'm not worried about who takes me home when I'm half cut already. <laughs> I felt completely lost. I didn't know what I didn't know what was happening. I, you know, I, there was no way I could change what happened. I just, I just stood there. I didn't know what to do. I, somebody had already gone for help, and I, it was hard to look at the guys, knowing that two of them were dead. Would it? Would if they themselves are intoxicated? Would you let them drive? Yeah, I. If they were really, really bad, I would say not to. But if, I just think well. If they get in trouble, it's their problem. I don't, as long as I'm not doing it, I don't care. Alcohol can kill. It's the number one killer of Canadian teens every year. Last year, 2,500 Canadians were killed by impaired drivers, and over 100,000 were seriously injured or maimed in alcohol-related accidents. I didn't want to drive, but I had to, you know, because is it, there's, there was no way of getting home after I finished drinking, so I had to drive. Have you ever been in a car? with somebody that was drinking and driving? I was in a car with a drunk person, but I didn't let them drive. I drove instead. Clutch, give me the keys, all right? I can drive, man. Clutch, man, the keys. I'll take you to Lucy's, all right? Just give me the keys. <laughs> you guys are... It is very hard to stay clean. When I feel depressed, I really think, well, if I just have one little drink, I'll feel better. And then I think, no, that's not going to help. That's just, you're not really going to feel better. You're, it's just going to be a false sense of security. You, you take it one day at a time, and, and if you don't drink that day, then you thank yourself. You say, well, that's good. I've done it for a day, and tomorrow's another day, and I'll worry about it when it gets here. Like when you're drinking, you can't do anything, right? You, you know, and you've got your mind on your, the bottle you're holding in your hand. But when you're not drinking, you got your mind on other things. Like, I got my mind on my car and my bike all the time, or, or and or my drawing. You're, you know, doing all this instead of the drinking now, right? Yeah. Probably would have had a beer last night if I, if I didn't do that. And it's a lot more creative. <laughs> yes. Third and passing out and on the floor. Everybody else that's not forcing it on you, it's it's you yourself. You, can, you make your own decisions for your own life, not anybody else. It's like, 
It's your own decision where you want to run your life. The spirit of Native Youth Council, um, to me, is to try to get youth to be um, substance free and try to um, be more or less a support group among young people for us to um, do activities that don't pertain to any alcohol or drugs. It gives them an opportunity also to learn more about their roots and their culture. And by doing that, that helps with self-esteem and self-worth. I'd like to ask you to be with us, and I pray for our brothers and sisters around the Yukon and around the world who are suffering from alcohol and drugs. And I pray that you'll be with us and give us the strength to take care of ourselves in order to help others. Thank you for this day. So that is um, Students Against Drinking and Driving. It, um, it's a group that informs students and the community about the dangers of drinking and driving and what can happen if people drink and drive. And we try and change people's attitudes about drinking and driving. Our mandate, if I, if I may say it as that, was to prevent injury and save lives. That was our entire goal. And if we saved one life by speaking and by giving films and by having poster contests or any sort of activities within the school, we, we, we reached our goal. I don't know. I think about it and I wish that it couldn't have happened. I wish that I could change it. I know there's no way I can. I know it'll never happen again. I would never drink and drive again. Alcohol is an increasing problem with teenagers. It has seriously affected my life. We should all think carefully about our reasons for wanting to drink. I think drinking is a responsibility to each person, and if, if a person can drink responsibly, then there should be no problem with it, but there are people who take it out of hand, and uh, if they can't handle it, then they shouldn't be doing it. Come on. I think at first it was really, really difficult for the school to accept that there was these goodies, two-shoe students that were trying to stop everybody from drinking, when in fact that's not what we were doing. Um, we were telling them, listen, if you're going to drink, because we know you do, just be responsible. Real problems, but can't always solve them. We need someone to listen, cause we all need some talking. Some try to ignore, but we've got to explore. We cannot hide it all away. Let's do this together. Oh, well, I'll talk to you, and you'll talk to me. We've got to reach out to set us so free. The grass we toss, coast to coast. We hear real stories from real people. The grass we toss. We're not alone, let's do this together, the grassy talks.